Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Wednesday Evening Prayer. Sorry to have missed you all last week um, after my surgery that was quite unexpected, um, and then an allergic reaction to the antibiotic they gave me. Um, it was quite a week. So fortunately, I am back in, <laughs> back in the saddle again. So let's begin with our prayer time. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening and the day is almost over. God who said, out of darkness, the light shall shine, is the same God who made light shine in our hearts to bring us the knowledge of God's glory shining in the face of Christ. Let us pray. We praise you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, by whose word the shadows of evening fall. Your wisdom opens the gates of morning. Your understanding orders the changes of time and seasons. Your will controls the stars as they travel through the skies. You are the creator of both night and day, making light recede before darkness and darkness before light. You cause day to pass and bring on the night, setting day and night apart. You are the Lord of hosts, living and eternal God, rule over us always to the end of time. Blessed are you, O Lord, whose word makes evening fall. Amen. For our scripture tonight, I want to read from 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse passed Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. So we have you know, talked about about Samuel and, and the birth of Samuel. And we're gonna, and, and as I'd said, Samuel's kind of this linchpin figure that connects old tribal Israel with then the time of the kings and the monarchs. And at this point in the story, we've already, Saul has already been the, made the first king over Israel. And there's already been this falling out between Saul and between God, because Saul has not done exactly as God commanded. And so Saul has lost favor with God. And David then will become the next king. And no one knows that, because as you read this, you discover David is the youngest son of a family not in any way connected to Saul, which usually was how 
you know, monarchy works, you, you know, you're somehow related to the previous occupant of the throne, unless there's some sort of revolution or violent overthrow and, you know, some huge family takes over from some other family. And, and yet here, even Samuel is scared of Saul. Because even Samuel says, well, what happens if Saul wonders what I'm doing? I mean, I, I, I can't tell him. <laughs> I can't tell the king that I'm about to go anoint the next king. And so God gives him this, you know, this cover, this, you know, this blind to put up so that no one knows what's really happening. And it's funny. I always think back on this. See, to me just a few years ago now, um, when my mom turned 70. And she's, don't worry, mom's good with her age. She won't mind that, you know, the fact I'm nearly 50, you know, not that far from it. So, you know, she's gotta be in her 70s. <laughs> but um, when she was gonna turn 70, we were trying to plan a surprise party. And my younger sister was trying to get all this together and figure out, well, I mean, it was gonna be huge, but we were trying to get family into town to do this. And mom's birthday's at Thanksgiving, or right around Thanksgiving. And at the time, I knew there was no way I could get away at Thanksgiving because of my job. And I said, well, what about Veterans Day that weekend? It happened to be on the weekend. I said, I could get away that weekend. Um, I wasn't serving in a church at the time. So I said, I could get away and I could probably get there. So she talked to other family and that worked for everybody. So we set it all up. And my sister's biggest concern, the whole thing, is she said, mom's gonna be really upset if we all show up at her house and she hasn't tidied up, she'll be all mad. And I was first off, I'm like, I don't think mom will be that mad. But second, I said, well, what if we do this? What if we get our older stepsister to say they're going to come that weekend to take them out to dinner for mom's birthday because you know it's right at thanksgiving and so and that that's a good weekend and that how about if they come up and they'll they'll take them out to dinner and we'll, we'll just have a nice evening i said because then she'll tidy everything up and she'll be expecting something because she'll be expecting them to come and, and have dinner and you know so she'll think nothing of it and Karen's like, oh, that's a great idea. So so that's what we did. Now, unbeknownst to my mother, I snuck into town. I flew in. Um, my mom's brother and his wife came. And then, and then, you know, his daughter and her whole family. So there's a ton of us there. This is a huge, big table of all of us. And so when they, we all gathered at my sister's house. So here we are all in Karen's house waiting, you know. So Kim and Greg head out and they go over and say, okay, we're leaving for moms. We're going to go pick them up. So then the rest of us took that as the cue to all leave. And we'll all go to the restaurant. And the whole thing worked beautifully. She didn't never suspected a thing because she just figured she was going out to dinner with Kim and Greg and, you know, and it was fine. And it worked because she had a little bit of info. You know, she had a little piece of what she needed. You know, it was enough to, she didn't suspect anything else. Oh, well, that's totally in character. It was totally in character for my older stepsister, because they're about an hour and a half away. You know, they're not real close. They're close, but, you know, not right around the corner. To say, hey, let's get together a weekend early. You know, the holidays are coming and we'll have dinner. Same thing here. It was totally in character for Samuel to have gone to make a sacrifice somewhere. It was totally in character for him to do this, to take a heifer and say, we need to sacrifice to the Lord, prepare yourself, sanctify yourselves. Everything he did was what he would normally do. He had been raised, you know, a priest of the Lord in the temple under Eli. And so this was totally in character. So in a sense, so, and he did, he did have a sacrifice, you know, in a sense, we didn't really lie to my mother. Kim and Greg did take them out to dinner. It's just, we had about 10 more people than they were expecting. So, you know, it's one of those things that if you keep it within character, it works. 
And this whole scene then plays out with Samuel because he's not totally sure what all is happening and who this new king is supposed to be. He's already a bit on edge. And so he sees in typical fashion, they would have introduced the eldest son first and then the next and then, you know, it, they would have done it in order of precedence. And so here comes the oldest son. So of course this must be the king. And Samuel gets the message, no, this is not the king. Don't look on his appearance or on his height or his stature. Don't look the way mortals do. Look inside his heart. That's where you need to look. You need to look at how God sees him. And this whole lesson is about how we need to see the way God sees the way God sees us, the way God sees the world. We need to see the world the way God sees it. There's going to be a lot of stories about David that are upsetting. There's a lot of things he does that to me are horrible. But for some reason, this is the person God has chosen. And I don't necessarily agree with all of it. There's things he did that I'm, I'm horrified by. But for some reason, this is the person God chose for a reason. I don't know that I'll ever know exactly what all those reasons are. But this is who God has chosen. And I have to be okay with that. I have to understand that I'm going to view David the same way Samuel viewed Eliab and all the others. With human eyes that don't get the whole picture. I get a piece of it. I get just enough to blind me, but I don't get the whole thing. And sometimes that's good <laughs> because there's things I don't need to know about. And sometimes it's bad because it's going to keep me from seeing something that I should see. Now, sometimes I'll get a wonderful surprise out of it like my mother did. And sometimes I won't. But because I see with the human heart and with human eyes, I'm blinded. There's a blind there that stops me from seeing the world the way God does. And so my prayer needs to be that I see the world the way God sees it. That I, I feel and I hurt for the world and love the world the way God does. That should be our prayer. And that's part of what we have to learn from Samuel. That's part of what he had to be reminded of and learn again. So there's our lesson that will kind of get us caught up so that then we'll have a, our Sunday sermon this week will be on part of the time when David was king. So let's continue with our prayers. Merciful God, we praise you that you give strength for every weakness, forgiveness for our failures, and new beginnings in Jesus Christ. Especially we thank you for your great love for the whole world the plants and animals that provide our food, those who support us in times of suffering, accomplishments that are pleasing to you, expressions of love unexpected or undeserved. People of God, for what else do we give thanks? Almighty God, you know all needs before we speak our prayers, yet you welcome our concerns for others in Jesus Christ. Especially we pray for all the free churches of the world. For victims of tragedy and disaster. For those who are captive or in prison. Those who weep with grieving. We pray for reconciliation with our enemies. People of God, for what else do we pray? Protect your people, O God, and keep us safe until the coming of your new dawn and the establishment of your righteous rule. By your Holy Spirit, stir up within us a longing for the light of your new day and guide us by the radiance of Jesus Christ, your Son, our risen Lord. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Have a good night.